And I'm Jessica. Oh, oh, it just told us that it's recording. Um, so like Tally said, my name is Jessica Price. I'm a social worker with Ramsey County. Um, I am in a unit right now called the Youth Intervention Team. Um, and we're a multidisciplinary team and we work specifically with youth, um, with teenagers. Um, in both a child welfare and a child protection um, role. And I have been working specifically with runaway and sexually exploited youth for almost the last 15 years, um, if you can believe that. This training tonight, I do have my co-facilitator coming on. Um, I don't think I see her yet, Crystal. I don't think I see, see you yet, but um, when she pops on, I will make sure to do um, introductions for her as well. Um, we usually do ask that you have your cameras on, um, but totally, um, if you're not comfortable with that tonight, feel free um, to keep your camera off. We also do say, to, you know, keep yourself muted if you've got like background noise or things like that going on. But otherwise, I really hope that this can be an interactive um, training and more of a, of a conversation um, as well. Um, I really want to thank you all for the work that you do with the youth, um, that you serve as, as foster parents, foster providers, um, and working with Ramsey County to, um, better serve our youth. So, um, some of the topics can, obviously just talking about sexually exploited youth, um, can be kind of a difficult topic. Um, and if there are younger kids or kids that you don't think maybe would be appropriate to be hearing some of these things, there is one video that we're going to watch. Um, and it, it, it can be um, kind of triggering and um, kind of difficult, um, just so you're aware. Um, so if you need to take a break at all, feel free. Um, if you have questions or you have you know, something that comes up that you're thinking of, like I said, this is interactive. So please feel free to, um, whether you just kind of wave, you know, um, <laughs> unmute yourself, interrupt, that's totally fine too. Um, Cause we want this to be helpful as well. Um, so I think with that, are there any questions no. that anybody has right now? Or should we just kind of get started with the power? Yeah. It's a PowerPoint, I've got a video. And then mostly it's just going to kind of be an interactive um, conversation as well. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Here. Let me see here. Now you all have to remember one thing while we're doing this training. Okay. Like Tally said, I've been working for the county for almost twenty years, and I am a social worker. I am not a tech genius. So <laughs> bear with me, and if we have to rewind anything in the video. Um, just know that I'm much better at um, working with kids than I am with doing technology. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm. So here we are going to get started here. Can you all see? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. All right, so this is the Sexually Exploited Youth 101 training. And this is a training that we specifically designed um, to talk with uh, our, our foster care providers. Um, so there it has me, Jessica Price, um, Youth Intervention Program, and then Crystal, who is logging on right now, um, her computer is updating her Zoom app. Um, she is a um, survivor and a former youth that was in um, Ramsey County's care. And we have continued to partner with her throughout the past couple years now. Um, and she's a pretty amazing young woman. So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna read off to you all what, the, what Ramsey County uses as our definition of a sexually exploited youth. So you're gonna hear, um, things like sexually exploited youth, which we, our acronym there is SEY. Um, and then you're also going to hear about trafficking, right? And so trafficking is kind of more of what you might be hearing like in the news, right? Where somebody is actually being trafficked, um, being sold, 
um, different things like that. And I think that it's really important to kind of um, distinguish that there are some differences between being a sexually exploited youth um, and being trafficked, all right? Um, so Ramsey, kind of the definition that we use is that a sexually exploited youth is a person under the age of 18 who has received drugs, food, shelter, protection, and other basics for life um, and or money for engaging in sex or sexual acts. This um, sexually exploited youth is a person who has been used in a sexual performance, including stripping or um, simulating sexual acts, sexually explicit photography, including photos on phones, um, or sexually explicit websites and or someone who is or has been recruited, traded, or sold for sex. And this is where you hear that term, um, you know, sex trafficked, right? And I think mm -hmm. it's really important for us to kind of distinguish um, the differences, right? As well as how uh, a sexually exploited youth, how easy um, it can be for one of our kids that are being exploited, specifically if you're looking at that first definition for re, um, receiving food, right, shelter, protection, basic needs, right? If you think about our kids that go into foster care and that need um, to go into homes um, that you provide, right? They're looking for safety. They're looking for food. They're right. looking for protection, right? right? Having those basic needs met. Um, based on some other trauma that they have experienced. Um, when somebody has been recruited, traded, sold for sex, that is the sex trafficking that you hear about more in the news. And I think it's really important because we aren't necessarily looking for you to identify um, to identify and say, okay, this this kiddo that I'm working, you know, that's come into my home and that I'm working with here, you know, they've been trafficked because it's pretty rare that a youth will tell you um, that's going to come right out and say I've been trafficked. Um, but I think it's important to know kind of what what are kind of some of those red flags that you're looking for. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, the other definition here is um, a person under the age of 18 who is a victim of criminal sexual conduct of any degree or criminal sexual predatory conduct can also fall within that definition of sexually exploited youth if he or she um, also falls within one of the three bullets above. Okay. Um, are there any questions on that? Does that make sense to people? No questions. Okay. Um, I, I think another important piece that I that's not on our necessarily on our PowerPoint here to talk about is kind of some of that critical legislation that's happened in Minnesota. Are people familiar? Have you heard about um, the safe harbor legislation? And if you have, you can just go ahead and unmute and, and say so. Safe harbor legislation. Um, I think I've heard, I of it. I heard into any, any of the, the actual policy itself or the rules and guidelines for it, but yeah, I've definitely heard of it. Okay, so safe harbor um, legislation is is all about um, adding the definition of a sexually exploited youth into uh, Minnesota's child protection codes. So that statute. So that's where I think it's really important for us to know that the, that the reason that this has happened is because of the safe harbor legislation. And for what it what it does is it really looks at the youth as a victim, whereas previously there. In my career, I don't I haven't heard of a lot of them, but there are kids who were prosecuted for prostitution. Right. And so what this is what it, this is doing safe harbor is allowing us to all be using the same terminology right and to be victim focused um, to be focused on keeping kids safe that's why it's under our child protection statutes which is also why um, you'll learn in the in the training tonight why it's so important if you do have concerns um, how who to reach out to and why it's important for you um, to be kind of our eyes and ears out there working with our most vulnerable youth 
Um, so now what I'm going to do, this is always the hardest part for me, is making sure that this works. So bear with me. Um, this is a short video that we're going to watch. Um, it's a it's it's a pretty old video, um, but it's one that has been. No matter how many times I've watched this, um, it it, it kind of hits me every single time. Um, so I just want you just to kind of be aware that it can be kind of um, triggering and um, kind of a difficult video, um, but we're going to definitely have some time to talk about this afterwards. Okay, so just bear with me now. Is it working? I think so. It's just taking it's loading here. Oh, okay. And then when you did it, did you do share this the sound too when you hit your share screen? Ooh, you know what? Let me do that. Let me go back so, here. Yeah, so you have to do unshare. Yeah, I think new share. There we go. Um, here it is. Share. Can you hear some music? Well, I, I did hear it, but now I don't hear it. Yeah, we can't hear it anymore. The arm around haven't always been that great. Sexual abuse is becoming kind of normal for you. And you think that other people don't have secrets that are as bad as you. And maybe you've tried to talk to somebody at school and they haven't really heard you. Or maybe they just haven't had time to listen to you. And so you're seeing these girls on, on the videos and they're so pretty and they're so sexy. And, and so your way at 12 of escaping into this fantasy world is to think about what it must be like to be one of these girls. And you know that adult men already look at you and you wonder how you can kind of use that. So one day you're coming out of school and there's a guy outside in a Cadillac and he's he's nice looking. I mean, he's he's got the baseball cap and the jeans and the Tims. And he tells you how pretty you are and you know how pretty your hair looks. And it's been a while since anybody even really noticed anything about you. And for the first time, you feel like somebody's really interested in you. Because now all of a sudden he's asking you about your dreams and your hopes and where your father's at. And he says that he can be a daddy to you. The people that I shouldn't have depended on, I was depending on for support, for support, for support. So that night he takes you to a club and he puts you up on the stage and he gives you a few drinks and there's men throwing dollars at you and it's scary but all the time you're just looking at his face in the back of the room and he's like, you know, go ahead baby girl, go ahead, you're doing it for daddy and you're feeling proud because nobody's ever said that to you. And so then that night he tells you that there's more stuff that you've got to do and he takes you into a room and there's a man there and he tells you to strip and you think this is something you'll never do and yet there's a part of you that already knew how to do this because that's what your stepfather's been doing to you all these years before and so you turn that trick and it's like a part of you has died inside and so you come out of the club that night and you get in the car and you know he's pumping 50 cents and he takes you to McDonald's and he tells you, you did a good job tonight, sweetie. And he's stuffing his pockets with the $1,000 that you made. And right now, you're happy. The people that I shouldn't have depend on, I was depending on for support. For support. like this is the best that it's ever going to get and everything else in your life has prepared you for this moment all the sexual abuse or the neglect or the drama or the pain or the trauma has prepared you for tonight where you stepped across the line that you always thought you'd never really quite step across and you 
don't realize that night what it will be like to be on the track and get raped. And you don't realize that daddy isn't really going to protect you. You don't realize what it's like to have a gun held to your head that night. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you catch your first STD. You don't realize what it's going to be like when you first come home and daddy beats you for the first time because you didn't make enough money. You don't know what it's going to be like to have cops offer to trade sex with you in exchange for not being arrested. And then sometimes you'll do that and they'll still lock you up anyway. You don't always like to sit up in jail and know that you just made $1,500 for your pimp last night, but he won't come down and put $200 bail on just to get you out a few days early. You don't know what it's like to, to walk down the street at 6 o'clock in the morning when you're just getting off work and people are starting their day and they see you and they know what you do and they look at you in a way that you just don't feel like you belong in that world anymore. And you don't know what it's like to feel like you've lost part of yourself along the way and to feel like you'll never leave. And no matter how many times you try to leave, he'll always find you and catch you. But that night, all you care about is the fact you're riding in the Cadillac and you're eating McDonald's and you're listening to 50 and you've got this one man who you really think loves you sitting right by your side. So that's, uh, hold on here. All right. So it's a pretty intense, uh, intense video. I know. Um, what are some of your thoughts after hearing that? What was that? I'm sorry. Does anybody have any thoughts after watching it? I mean, I've seen it a couple times, and I just think like when you see that the average age is 12 years old, that's mm -hmm. one thing that I always like I just had no idea. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of young. Mm -hmm. Very young. It's very, very young. Um, and yeah, that's one of that's one of the the pieces that um, you know when you see that stat pop up there. Um, that's one of those, those things that you, you look at and you read and, you know, we all have kids that we, we care about, right. And we all, um, can think about that, that age, right. Um, and that's really a, that's a hard one. Um, the other, the other piece is, you know, talking here, um, as I did in the video about, looking at 80 to 90% um, of victims of sexual exploitation have reported being previously sexually abused. And I think that that's a really important thing for us to remember um, because you are our partners, right? Here uh -huh. in Lindsay County and you are the individuals and families that have you know stepped up here and said we want to open up our home our hearts to serve the kids that are the most vulnerable right, right. and we know that if there is a kid that's coming into ramsey county right coming into the system um they're coming in typically based off of some pretty significant trauma right whether it's trauma that they're currently experiencing or trauma that they have experienced in the past you know and that's where i think it's really important and i'm really proud of ramsey county for um, reaching out to our partners um you all that are there uh, keeping our kids safe right and partnering with us to provide safe homes um and I think another another piece that's really important to remember um, is that you know your um, your role is so important in helping us as social workers do our job better, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you know nobody gets into social work for the money, nobody gets into it um, for the fame, <laughs> right? Um, 
you get into it because you want to you want to work with you want to work with kids and families you want to help right you want to support the community and part of that is understanding what our role is um and what the role of our partners are um and you all as as foster providers here too um because when we leave our job um you're still there right you're still there providing service support love right um caring right providing those basic needs and so we need you to kind of know what are those what are those signs that we look for as well um i do see that crystal got on here i know she's texted me and she's having some um computer difficulties with things kind of freezing coming on and off can you hear me crystal yes can you hear me yeah oh okay (laughs) well crystal and i'm not sure if your camera works but um um i i did a a little short introduction um at the beginning and um introduced you before you were on but let um all of the providers here know that you are um a survivor and that you have been partnering with Ramsey County um, here to help us um, provide a, a better training, right? And to also give us some insight into how we can do better work. So I know that we have kind of our, as far as our PowerPoint is set up here, um, how how do you feel about I know we talked earlier about you kind of sharing some of your story too. Can you see me? Yeah. Oh okay. Okay. How do I feel? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last part? Just the last part. Do you wanna just share kind of some of your your story that you're comfortable with sharing, your experience working with Ramsey County, why you feel like it's um, important for us to be doing this training for foster parents. Okay. <laughs> uh, <in> the spot. <laughs> um, I just wanna know if everybody can hear me because my throat's not the best right now. But, yes. um, okay. Um, my experience with Ramsey County, ooh, it was a crazy experience. Um, I'm gonna say at first I did not want to work with Ramsey County because I didn't like what kid wants to. Um, it was difficult at first because I was viewing it as, oh, they're attacking me and they don't want to help me and they just want to lock me up and they don't really care. Um, And then I got to establish relationships with my probation officer and um, officers of the community, um, therapists of the county, and it just changed my view on a lot of things because they actually cared. They actually sat down and wanted to understand what I was going through and what I needed help with. Um, It takes a minute. It's not an overnight process like, oh, hey, we're best friends now. Like you have to actually establish that relationship, that trust, that understanding. It takes time, like, and a lot, a lot of work. why it's important to have this foster care training. Is that what you asked? Yeah. Oh, um, just to give insight on pretty much, I don't know, say teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I was a teenager at once and I was like in and out of the system a lot. So um, it's a lot of, no, I'm not gonna say that. Um, patience, patience is a big thing. Um, patience for who? Patience for who? For, oh, for the uh, youth, for the teenagers, for the kids. 
it is a big thing um you have to have a lot of patience and understand try to understand where they're coming from have an open mind um because if you just go in there like hey i want you to change or um i'm trying to help you they're not gonna receive that tough love or the the love that you're trying to give you might seem like oh hey i'm trying to you know help you i'm trying to be here for you but they're not gonna take it as that um my experience a lot of a lot of kids just see it as like oh i'm just a piece of paper i'm just somebody in the system like to get a paycheck off of me so they don't really care and will completely shut you out or act out in different ways um some negative some positive depends on the person in their situation um Mm. what was the other question <laughs> i'm sorry well one of the things when we watched the video um earlier that we were t- um kind of talking about and that tally brought up um it, it was talked about that the average age um of of being trafficked or exploited um is is 12 and people talking about you know that just that's a really tough statistic to hear, right? And, <clears throat> you know, I think that there's a lot of what what we know is with the exploitation piece, the grooming that goes on, um, and then it's not necessarily somebody, you know, walking up to a girl and saying, okay, you know, kidnapping her and saying, this is what you're gonna be doing, right? But do you wanna talk about some of what your experience was? Um, with the exploitation um okay grooming yeah that's a um, tough tough process um that's a lot of ways to groom somebody and 12 is the age that people usually you know get exploited and stuff like that some can be way younger because you can start grooming a child from the age of like four and that sick so yeah that is the age limit um i was a part of that when i was 12. Mm-hmm. um the, the grooming process that i personally went through was um pretty much doped me up on drugs so they can break me and breaking a person or your victim and whatnot is pretty much making them feel like all hope is lost and nobody cares about you and why does my life matter anyways Mm -hmm. it's the process that they do to break their women or boys or men um so they can listen they're trained well pretty much um you want me to go in and that's about that. No, no, you don't know. I want you to just share what you're comfortable with. And I think that part of this is that we don't, you know, you don't necessarily need to, and I think this is an important piece um, to understand too, when it comes to working with kids who have been a victim of exploitation or trafficking, right? Um, like I said, I've been working with runaway and sexually exploited youth for about the last 15 years. Um, And in those 15 years, I have had one client, one out of all of the kids I've worked with that has, I've walked in and started meeting with who said, I've been sex trafficked. Otherwise, every other kid that I have worked with, right? You see the signs, you see the red flags, you see the concerning behavior, right and you're in this spot as the social worker right or as the foster provider in saying this just doesn't like there's just something not right this is really concerning right and i know when crystal and i met and talked um uh, a couple of years ago now about kind of starting this training um one of the things that you said that um, I still have written down that still, you know, was one of those things that really struck me was that, you know, the behavior that we see, right, the behavior that a kid is displaying is them asking for help, right? And I think sometimes we get caught up on the behavior, 
Um, and one of the things that I always try to look at is the behavior is a symptom, right? It's a symptom of a, of a bigger issue, right? A bigger thing that we are needing to help this kid to work through, right? And sometimes those behaviors are the things that, you know, they're, they're hard to deal with. It's not easy, right? And just yeah. because we, and like we talked about with the safe harbor um, legislation, just because we can see um, these, these kids as victims doesn't necessarily mean that they see themselves as victims, right? Yeah. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that, Crystal? Because I knew that was going <laughs> to make you do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, being in sex trafficking for so long or just starting out, um, no, we don't see ourselves as victims. It's like kind of like a, I don't know, it's a brainwash type thing. Like you're just, you're not in your right mind, I would say. Like what you think it's supposed to be or it is, it isn't. Um, ooh, yeah, behavior. Um, you can see the red flags of, and in you the behavior where it's like, and when it comes to affection of, I don't want to be touched or I don't want to be hugged or your, your, um, your kindness is not being received as kindness. It's being received as like, I want to say, um, a wolf in sheep's clothing mm -hmm. pretty much. So it's not, we're not so trusting and, um, open. So no, you're not going to have a person like, oh yeah, well I'm getting trafficked or, um, I have a pimp or anything like that. I know they're going to deny it really mm -hmm. hard and, or lie, um, running away, um, anger issues is how we bottle everything in, whether it's sadness or disgust, it will come out as anger. Mm -hmm. So it's always an underlying reason and issue as to why we're so angry, um, and I think that's a really, a really important piece to, to really kind of talk about here, because the, I mean, this is, this is the reality, right? This is kind of what you, you sign up for when you step into becoming a foster parent and especially a foster parent of, you know, um, working with really the challenging ages of, you know, 12 and up, right? Um, and part of that is being able to kind of recognize some of those behaviors, trying to, you know, um, reach out if there's concerning things you're seeing. Um, part of this, I want to go to share the screen really quick, just to go back to this, um, this PowerPoint um, crystal for us to kind of go over as well um, with some of those red flags. And I'm maybe I'll, we can just kind of go through this together and, you know, if you want to add different pieces as well. Um, but, you know, kind of the presence of an older dominating boyfriend. Um, this is a big one missing school. Right, Crystal? Yeah. And that was a big one for you, right? That is a big one. Mm -hmm. Tat cool. Yeah. And sometimes that's, you know, and that's part of how, you know, my the program that I've worked with for so long was getting connected with kids um, who were being exploited um, or trafficked was because of truancy, right? Because of kids running away, leaving home without permission, right? Um, the other thing here is tattoos or other branding marks, um, multiple sexually transmitted diseases. Um, unfortunately, this is a really um, a really frequent one that that you know, we work with, um, with the population that, that I do with my program, um, when kids are running away, right. Um, when That's kids are picked up, mm -hmm. you know, um, having the different STIs, that's why it's really important when kids, um, are in run and are found, um, and placed into foster care or shelter placement, uh, making sure that they're getting that medical care right away, getting those checkups um signs of violence you know bruising cuts burns um a lot of times like the the masking charges they used to call it such as like the curfew violations truancy um, other status offenses which again is the runaway um 
the homeless your, uh, no i was just saying on your side violence is um you could put easily startled um um or sensitive to noise Mm -hmm. they do trauma bond in sex trafficking they will do a lot where that can cause that too just more than like the bruises and burns and stuff it, um what is that where you flinch easily um where you're like you jump back i don't know the correct mm -hmm. term but, um, but i don't know what you're talking about um that part too yeah well, and then we've got the the substance use, right? And you talked about that too as part of your story, Crystal. Um, is that you know, drugs... a big part? Mm -hmm. A big part. That is like their main thing to use in sex trafficking. It weakens you. It weakens your mind, heart, and your spirit. It weakens you, and that's what they want you at, and it makes you uh, dependent on that mm -hmm. drug to get through your day, to get through anything that you got going on with that person or your routine, the abuse, it, mm -hmm. they get you through it. They use drugs a lot, very yeah. much. Other one that was important was the unexplained money and clothes, jewelry, nails. Um, that's a big one, right? We, we hear a lot of kids who are running away, right? That they're, they're running away, they're gone, and then they show up and they've got new hair, they've got their nails done, and that's all part of that grooming process as well. Um, and that's where, you know, those, um, those red flags, those signs that you see, that's where it starts with, with you all too, with what you're seeing, right? Um, and when you have questions, right? This does, I'm just concerned about this. You know, this this child was placed at my home. Things were going well initially. Now they're leaving. They're coming home late. They're not coming home. Um, different things like that, just to be aware of. Are there any questions? I feel like we've we've been talking a lot here at you but i'm wondering what kind of questions are, are do you all have what kind of things are on your mind right now anybody it's a safe place <laughs> I mean, i'll start off by i i remember one story i think that you told in this um one of these trainings that i was at and hopefully if i say something then you got somebody else will will think of something and chime in too. But I remember a story that you said that, you know, like a person or a girl was running away all the time or she was running away from the her family, but it really wasn't about running away. It was that she didn't want her family to get hurt by mm -hmm. the, the yeah. and I don't know whose story that, you know, I, I, I just remember I, this story, I, I haven't forgotten it, but I never thought of it that mm -hmm. way. And I think about that a lot. Like she wasn't worried about, she, she didn't want her family to get hurt. So that's why she kept running away. Yeah, that would be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to repeat your story <laughs> or say more information, but I remember you talking about that. And it, it really, um, I don't know, it just hit me because I never, I wouldn't, you know, how many kids run away? Like we have lots of kids in foster care or, you know, on Jessica's case with that run away. And it wasn't about like, oh, I hate my house. I'm trying to protect my family is what mm -hmm. she was, what, what, what I heard you say. Um, and I didn't mean to take your story, but I no, was- No, you're fine. Okay, I just, you know, okay. it, it just really, it, it really um mm -hmm. was like, wow, okay. Really well, yeah, and Crystal, I think you should talk more about that. Cause I think it's really important to know that not, no one's story, is just like the other person's story, right? It's like anything in life. We all have our own stories. We all have our own, you know, things that we have have been through and experienced. And that is something that really hit me too with talking with Crystal. So maybe you can kind of share a little bit more about that from your experience. Yeah. Um, I had to talk with my ex-probation officer about that. And I was like, oh, I think we just had a big miscommunication. Nobody was understanding. It was more so looking like, oh, we're trying to help you because you're a child and you don't need to be doing this and doing that. 
And from my point, it was like, no, you don't understand. I'm trying to protect everybody. I'm like, I can't tell you certain things because then that will get you involved and potentially hurt. So me fighting so much in court with my mom and my probation officer for me to have my freedom was so they can have their lives pretty much. Um, I was dealing with some pretty rough people and uh, on more than one occasion, their lives were threatened or um, it would be like a pop up at the house and drag me out the house and mom's like, oh my gosh. And, you know, I'll fall out with the family and whatnot. And I was just trying to keep everybody safe. And mm -hmm. I, it's not like I could just come out and say that. I mean, I could have came out and say that, but me being me at the time, I was just thinking of everyone's safety and how I can go about this the most uh, cautious but sneaky way without harming them, like causing, bring the harm to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, a really important piece to to kind of think about, especially with the the population of of teens that I work with, right? And I think that's something that I really um, try to remember too. Is that Crystal said to me one time, "It wasn't about me not being safe at home; it was about me making sure that the people that I loved and cared about at home were safe." Yeah. And so I, you know, when you think back to that that child brain, right? And you think about whether it was you, Crystal, or you know any other youth, right? Your brain's not fully developed, right? You're not fully able to, to really think through all of these different pieces. But here you are as this, what, 13, 14, 15 year old kid who's trying to, who's trying to, you know, figure out this world of how to manage keeping family safe while also trying to keep yourself safe right and mm. trying to express this to people right and i think about how that could come off right and how you may you may not be able to communicate that right and i think that that's where i remember you talking about how important the communication was and just that establishing trust and it takes time right like you didn't with your specific worker, it wasn't like you were, oh, hi, um, social worker <laughs> slash probation officer. Thanks for coming into my life, <sighs> right? Bringing me into court. Um, it's, it's not like that. And so that's where I think it's really important for our foster providers and our community members to understand kind of what we think and might see in our head as what a victim right is in comparison to maybe how a victim might actually react in situations um, or hold themselves. Can you talk about the trust piece, Crystal? Because I think that you had some pretty um, amazing uh, people that kind of intervened in your life that were in positions of power, authority, right? Like social work, probation, police. Can you talk about the relationship and how important those relationships were to you? Um, yeah, I am a probation officer and this one officer, um, I used to pop up everywhere and I just didn't know how he knew where I was and had my phone number he, for some odd reason. However, he always used to get my phone number. I uh, used to have my location um, and pop up on me and just check up on me. Like, what's going on? What are you doing? And every time I got arrested, he was there. And I'm just like, how are you knowing about these things? And he was just every time just there back to back, like no matter what. And he's like, I know you don't want to hear this right now, but um, we care about you. We want you to get together with your mom. She's just, she's having a hard time understanding what's going on. And it was like, every time I seen him, he just had something to me, talk to me about something, or he'll just come get me, pull me over. And he would just pop up everywhere. And I just, I didn't, I didn't trust him at first because I was real skeptical. Of how do you know my location all the time? And what do you really want from me? Because again, 
there are officers and doctors and lawyers that are in sex trafficking and they pay for little girls and boys. So you don't know who to trust. Everybody mm-hmm. looks suspicious to you. And that's a hard thing to get over of letting your wall down and being vulnerable mm-hmm. was a really tough, tough thing. Um, Cause I didn't trust anybody. Like, you couldn't say anything to me. I'm not stopping for you. I'm not talking to you. I don't care if you're trying to help me. I don't care if you seem sincere. I just don't trust it. Trust it is always a catch to something. That was my mindset. Um, and I gave him a really hard time. <laughs> um, he didn't know how to get through to me. So he tried my mom. And anybody that knows me knows I love my mom. I love my family. Um, so he did, he did that. He tried to get through to my mom and it worked. Um, after a couple of years, it worked. Um, I started to loosen up and call him when I was in trouble. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I've called anybody when I was in trouble because I've been handling it on my own. I never needed help. So um, yeah, he was a really important person in my life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, those, those relationships, um, those, I mean, relationships are everything, right? And I think for, you know, all of you sitting here in this training tonight, um, you all understand the power that comes with um, relationships and building relationships with the the kids that you're, um, that you're serving, right? Um, and it's not something where, you know, you had this expectation that you're going to, you know, have a kiddo um, placed into your home and that you're just going to grow this beautiful relationship and it's going to be all, you know, butterflies and rainbows and, and all of those things. I mean, there's ups and downs that come with, um, with doing foster care and working with kids who have experienced, you know, significant trauma and trying to build that relationship and show that you are a person that cares um, and that you're a person that's there. And I think that's really important to remember. And, you know, um, there's a lot of different ways that people get involved in doing foster care, whether it's through, you know, through kinship um, for customers everywhere agree. If your pup is out of warranty, I can hear someone's TV. I'm not sure who is. There we go. The breakdown. Car shield. There was no way that I couldn't afford to get my car fixed. Okay. Um, but I think really like looking at that relationship and kind of how you try to engage with um with the kids that you're with and work on kind of establishing trust. And you know, I can probably just kind of share. I had one one client that I worked with for I worked with her from when she was 12 years old up until she turned 18. Um, and um, it was, those were some tough years, right? Some tough years and a lot of walking through some tough times um, with this young lady. And there was times when I knew that she knew that I cared, right? And there were other times when I cared and I knew that it was not going anywhere. Right. She was not there to receive it. She didn't care. Um, But I think another important piece is like to just kind of keep showing up um, and having some presence in these kids lives. And I think that's a really important thing for for you all to remember, too, with the work that you do as providers, um, whether that means, you know, you're a respite option. Right. Um, You know, you bring in, um, you know, the community. And different people to to kind of keep showing up for these kids, um, even when their behaviors are tough, even when um, it can be really challenging, because it does matter, right? Um, and I know I in in this work, it's like you don't you don't do the work um, with the kids, you know, expecting anything other than where they're at, right? I think that we have this beautiful job of being able to walk with people through life and some of their most challenging times. Um, and while it can be pretty heartbreaking sometime too, um, when it's, when there's successes, 
um, when people feel cared about, when you feel that that trust um, building, that is something that you kind of you can't you can't ignore, right? That's a pretty beautiful thing. And I know specifically for Crystal, there were people involved in her life that continued to care about her all those years ago, um, and it's pretty amazing, right, to see where where you're at right now, Miss Crystal. <laughs> and now you're here sharing your story and being there so, for so many other youth. I'm gonna share my screen again really quick because I want to get to this other piece. All right, share. Um, okay, we kind of talked about this. Who's protecting who, right? Um, the impact on families, you know, setting boundaries, right? That's really, really, really hard. Um, working with kids, right? They set their own boundaries. We try to set our boundaries as adults um, and trying to figure out how to navigate that together. Um, asking for help. I think that can go both ways, right? For you as a provider, as well as for the youth. And sometimes I think it's about putting the right people and the right supports and resources in place. This is another um, thing that we, we put together, Crystal and I. Things to remember when working with teens. Communication. I think we've talked a lot about that. How important that is um and it's not what you say it's it's how you say it can you talk a little more about that crystal because that was that came directly from you yeah it's not what you say it's how you say it yeah mm, that is it's something i still use to this day and i teach it to my kids too it's not what you say it's how you say it. it's your tone of voice it's how you coming off to somebody um you can seem like you're trying to help somebody, but how you're saying it and how you're, um, what is that word? Um, I'm just like having- Your intention? Right your intention? Um, yeah, along the lines of that, it's just, it's pretty much how you come off. Like, like I say, first impressions are everything. Um, and it is so exactly what you're saying and how you say it. Like I feel like people should take the time to actually think about what they're gonna say before they say it and how it's gonna come off and how that person is gonna perceive it because I don't feel like a lot of people do that. Especially on my point of growing up, it was like a lot of thing like, it was like, oh, you're just a job type thing. I don't really care about what's going on with you. I'm just trying to get paid or I'm just trying to hurry up and write this off. And that's how a lot of teens will feel depending on how you say something and mm -hmm. what you say. You can have good intentions, but how it comes off, it, it means a lot too. Mm -hmm. We talked about feeling safe and secure and not judged, you know? And I think another part of this is, is just remembering, like if you've had a kid that's experienced whatever trauma that they have where they've ended up you know, needing to go into, into our foster care system, right? And to be placed, um, making sure that they feel safe and secure before you maybe start asking them a bunch of questions. Um, also looking for signs that are missed, right? And we talked about some of those signs, um, but looking for, you know, it's kind of like a puzzle, right? Trying to put a puzzle together and you're not gonna necessarily, you know, have a kid saying, like I said, I've, I'm being trafficked, I'm being exploited, right? And I think it's hard right now, especially in the um, with social media and what yeah. we're currently experiencing. When we talk about exploitation, this is why I think it's so important, right? We talk about um, survival sex. We talk about, um, you know, kids being exploited for a safe place to live, um, a meal right? Using someone's phone um, if they're on the run. And I think that it's the exploitation piece um, 
I think it's harder right now because of just the culture that we live in, right? I think it's pretty, our culture in itself is pretty exploitive um, if we really think about that. And so then talking with youth that may see like what they're doing, you know, sending pictures, you know, trading sex for whatever it may be is not that big of a deal because they're seeing it all over social media, right? Um, and that's an important thing for us to remember too. Um, this one, teens can tell that you care, show them that you care. Um, and I think the most important thing that you can do with, with working with youth is to keep showing up, uh -huh. um, keep showing up. And part of that is, um, you know, kids are, kids are waiting for you to show your true colors, right? Who you really are. Um, and it's important that you, that you show up. And that you show them that you care right and you do that by you know maybe when they they come to your home it's you know having um some food there that they might like or making a trip to the store to get some things that make them feel more comfortable um this one your voice matters you as a person matters right that's an important one so part of this training too is wanting to also, you know, to to talk with you guys about exploitation and trafficking and kind of what are some of those signs to look for, right? With the the vulnerable youth that you're working with. But the other piece is that I think it's important that we talk about like what do you do when you have concerns, right? Let's say you have a kid that's been placed with you as a as a provider. And you're seeing some of those red flags, right? And maybe the social worker that has placed this kiddo, maybe the kid's just gotten on their caseload and they haven't really developed a, a, a really great rapport or trust with, with this kid. I mean, you're, you're our eyes and ears, right? You're there around the clock. You're right. the ones that are there when they're getting off the bus, you know, you're the one that are getting the calls if they're not showing up for school, right? So what do you do when you have concerns? What, what, I mean, have, have any of you, are you comfortable sharing if, if anyone's had to, um, to reach out or has had concerns? Um, one of the things that we, like, who do you contact, right? right. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Maybe the worker. Oh, we got two crystals. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> Is it still going? Yep. Maybe the worker. Contacting the worker. Absolutely. So one of the things is, you know, we talked about that, um, the, the safe harbor, right? Um, mm -hmm. In the child protection statute. And so one of the things we say is if you have a kid that you're working with, right, and you have concerns um, about exploitation, you feel like they really could benefit from, you know, having someone come out and meet and talk, um, contact Ramsey County Child Protection to make a report. Um, and the number right there, it's on this um, form. It's 651-266-4500. Uh, and that's, you can call 24 hours, right? And maybe you just have a question and you say, you know, I, I, I went to this training. This is my concern. This kiddo has been leaving, leaving my home. Um, you know, I also say contact your licensing worker for assistance, right? And they can get you connected with, um, you know, a child welfare assessment for a social worker to meet um, with the youth, right? And to kind of start that relationship. Um, the other piece that I think is so, so important is, you know, call the police to file a missing persons report if a child leaves your home without permission. This is so important. Um, this is what we ask of all parents. And of course, what we ask of our foster parents is letting letting the police know and that's kind of our first um 
our um our first request here is that if kids are leaving and they're not coming home that you're filing that report um if you don't know where they where they are um because these are these are our kids right and you are the ones that we are um, trusting to to care for them the other piece is i want to show it's really hard to see um i think on this depending on what kind of um, computer you're on but um, we have a screening tool that we use for every single youth um, that comes into Ramsey County. And we're trying to identify all of the Ramsey County social workers are trained on working with sexually exploited youth, um, understanding what exploitation and trafficking are. And this is, um, this is the form that we use um to to really help us screen cases and decide how we are going to you know to proceed right um and this would tell us are they at risk are they high risk or are they a confirmed victim and again like i was said before i can tell you um there is there may be plenty of times that you think oh this kid i, I really feel like this kid is being exploited or trafficked, you know, all these different signs. And the kid's not just going to come out to you and say, yep, that's what's happening to me. Um, and so part of it is, is like to work on building that trust, right? And that's where you and your job as a foster provider are so important. I feel like we're doing a lot of talking here. What are there questions, comments? Um, excuse me, could some of the um, foster kids, um, could they think that um, maybe if we, okay, if we talk to them and everything, they probably get afraid, okay, um, maybe I should do this. Uh, I'm going to test and see if she's going to send me back or, you know, something like that. You know, they'd be like, okay, I'm going to see how much trust I can have in her, mm -hmm. you know, as a foster parent to see she going to just throw me back into the system because that's what I don't say I ain't gonna say a lot of them but some foster kids probably feel that way mm -hmm. you know they've been exploded and stuff they be like okay that's the only way I can you know express myself to see how much she really care about me mm -hmm. so. yeah testing that's I think that's a really really great um comment to make and I think that you know, a lot of times when you're looking at those, right, looking at those behaviors, right, as as the symptom. And that's where I think having, you know, working with teenagers, like I, when I work with kids, like I, they're smart, they're all smart, right? Uh -huh. And my thing is, is I don't, I don't lie to kids. I try to be really honest. I try to give kids the information I try to tell them what the law is. I try to explain to them what can happen if they continue to leave home without permission. If they continue to run away, um, I try to lay it all out for kids. And I think part of that is just out of respect, because I really do feel that as humans, when we know better, we can do better, right? Yeah. Yep. And so part of that is. Like we talked about that before, like set, having those boundaries, right? I think being really clear about what your boundaries are and not just saying like, these are the rules, but like, this is why, right? And I think that's really, really important for kids to understand the reasons behind it, right? And kind of why you set that as a boundary. Um, as I think kids will, they will push and push and push, right? And being really clear on kind of what your boundaries are um and then like following through on that too right um and that can be hard right especially when you you know working with kids and, and families like if you don't have a lot of um a lot of means right you can't take a bunch of things away 
right? You're, you're a brand new foster provider for this kiddo. You are working on establishing a relationship. Like how do you start taking things away? And part of that is like setting those boundaries and those expectations, but then being there to work through um, things as they come up with those kids, right? Um, Crystal, are you, did you just raise your hand or is that, I don't know, maybe that was up there for a while. No, you're maybe not, you're muted. Um, but I think that's a really hard, that's a really hard piece. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot that I was muted. Um, yeah, and Della Taylor had her hand up first too. Um, my hand, my hand been up ever since the video started. Oh, <laughs> okay. Because I'm like, wait. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Because what she was saying of how she, um, how they'll just do stuff, and act out, and test you, and that does happen where they will push and push to see how much you can take or if you really actually care about them because kids I've known a couple of kids that I work with that has done that um because they're so used to people giving up on them or just like write them off like okay I don't want to deal with it they're too much so then that's how they test to see if you really care which is like not a good way but it's the way that they know how to um really pick out the ones that care about them and the ones that don't mm -hmm. and some will do that and it's just like yeah with your boundaries and also trying to find a way to understand and communicate with them like, hey, I care. You don't have to do it this type of way. We can try another way. And if that doesn't work with you or you don't feel like it's sincere, then we can try another way. It takes a lot of patience and being consistent with it because then that shows like, OK, well, they're not going to give up on me. They keep coming back. They keep trying harder in different ways to communicate with me, and understand me and show me that they care they might open up that way. Okay. I mean, I want everybody to talk, but I just I was kind of looking online too at just statistics because sometimes you think, oh, we live in Minnesota, you know, there's not that much sex trafficking here. And I'd really like you to talk a little bit about that. Um, when I was what I was looking at, it said that, you know, we're one of the top three cities or one of the top cities in the nation for sex trafficking. And I don't know if Crystal or Jessica, you could talk a little bit about um, maybe where this is happening or what you see or how, you know, what are statistics that you, I'm a statistic person. So what kind of statistics do you have on that? Well, you know, I, um, I'm not usually a, a statistics person, but what, what I will say is, um, I think what's out there in the media, um, a lot of times what you see on TV, on Facebook, um, different things like that. Um, I think a really important thing to remember is that it is extremely rare for traffickers to go and just kind of grab girls off the streets right um not going to say it doesn't happen but that grooming process right that breaking that crystal was talking about um earlier is so important to really know and understand um that is more of the reality i think the other piece to remember that um the kids are that are the most affected by trafficking and exploitation um, are kids that um, are already vulnerable based off of past trauma that they've experienced, right? Abuse, neglect. Um, and I also think it's really important that a lot of times the, the kids that you hear about in the news, right? The kids that are missing, a lot of times are, are your white girls, right? That's what you're hearing about. And that is not what we see um as the kids that are being affected it's our our kids of color it's our black girls our brown girls our black boys our brown our brown boys um it's our native american um family members and so i think it's really important to remember that um this is where um it's really important to remember who is who is actually being affected and how you can impact you know your community and i think that you all signing up to be foster providers um 
think it sounds great in theory, right? Um, but when you're actually doing the work and working with kids, it's it's not a it's not an easy easy thing to take on. And that's why I think it's so important that you remember that you are the eyes and ears of um, of the county for us trying to work on keeping kids safe. What else are people thinking? I know there's a lot of um, cameras off, but are, are people learning things tonight? Are there things well, that you didn't you kinda, know? Well, I think you kind of yeah. asked one of my questions that, and the question that I had was kind of what's like the the driving factor into these cases? Is it people that are coming from homes where they've been abused? Are they you know single parent homes where you know, maybe the parents is, and family are on drugs or something already, or it was kind of like the biggest cause, you know, of we having young girls and, and kids being victims of uh, trafficking. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think, you know, those, those stats that we looked at before on the video, um, you know, our kids that have been victims of abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual, of neglect, they are at much higher risk, much higher risk of being a victim of exploitation or trafficking. It doesn't mean that every kid that has been exploited and or trafficked um, necessarily has been a victim of abuse, but we know that that they're, they're um, predisposed, right, to be more likely to become a victim. I saw there was something in the chat here. Hold on one second. Chanel just said, "Can I asked, um, she says that we need to do more research on cultural trafficking. And I just wanted to know if she could explain her comment so we could get a, a, I would, a clear understanding. Oh, yeah, but if you're more comfortable typing, find her. There you are. I think it's just uh, mostly brown skin natives and um, African American kids are the trafficking. Um, some, some, some stuff is a, uh, how would I say it? Hmm. It's, it's done in the dark, uh, meaning that uh, it, it, it's not out there, it's covered up, it's, it's covered. Um, so, but as far as the, um, the black, the brown, the the indigenous, the, the the Native Americans, they're they're the ones that are always gonna be like the poster child for this the sickness that's out there. But I, I think it's all over. I think it's Somalians, I think it's uh Caucasians, I think it's around the spectrum. I don't think absolutely that there's a high or a low. I think it's it's right here. And and when we look at it, that's how we need to look at it. We don't we don't need to look at it like it's just it's a black thing because it's not a black thing, sweetie. That's why I had the comment. Oh. You said it's mostly it. Maybe that's what you see in Ramsey County, but baby, please. <laughs> mm -mm. No, nope. And I'm sorry if that if my comment was was not. Um... I mean, that's probably how you see it. I can't take that away from you, but I I know some things that it's just not a black thing. It's nope, it didn't. You're right. <laughs> Saying that it was in more on the news, covered more. Yeah, I think that when, so when we look at it. Yeah, so versus our black people aren't being covered in the news like is the no. occasion culture. Yeah, so and, that, everyone, and that's the that's the really um the really change. frustrating piece, right? And I think this is where it's really important for for um social workers and people that are working with with um, kids and families every day to recognize, right? Um, recognizing my privilege as, as a white woman um, and acknowledging the fact that when I look at posters about trafficking and I see little blonde haired, um, blue eyed girls um, and knowing that that's, that's not always who we're seeing as our victims. Um, and it's important to know who is being victimized um, and that every victim deserves for people to care about them and to fight for them and to support them and to have people that speak up for them 
So I think it's it's a really, really important thing that we all have to play an important role in. Um, but absolutely, you're you're one hundred percent correct that it it affects every race, every religion, you know, every socioeconomic. Um, but I think that we have to really look at um, the kids that we work with who are especially vulnerable, given what they have experienced in their lives. Are there any other let's, comments or questions? Let's hear from uh, some people who haven't talked yet, if you don't mind. I'd love to kind of kind of get your. I have a question. Yeah. It, it's Crystal, right? If if she doesn't mind, like answering, if it's not too personal, you know. Um, I watch. I mean, it's TV, but you know, I watch like Special Victim Unit. You know, it's like twenty three seasons. Like, um, and what I've noticed with like in the SUV, like a lot of you know females and, and men are like, you know, sex trafficked in, in that type of environment. How, how did you like in a lot of in the show, they were scared like to talk and tell, you know, and being afraid that if they leave, they'll be caught and, you know, they have to go back. Like, how did you know you were safe and it was okay, you know, and to be able to breathe, do you understand the question? Like, cause when you're in that environment, and you have somebody after being, you know, broken and stuff. And how, how did you know that you're okay, that you were safe? You, you, does that make sense with the question? Oh, Crystal, you're ma you're so muted. I'm, I'm sorry, it's my phone. Um, Crystal? I can't really hear. Crystal, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. You yeah. can? Okay. Okay. So did you hear any of that or no? Okay. Um, I was just saying for me that um, I'm not going to say that I really felt safe. But I will say that, and I will say that um, I have people that I know I had support. I would say that um, getting out of the game, you never really say you're never you're never really safe. You never really feel safe um, unless that person is locked up, or not even then, because anybody's touchable. Um, it's like if you're in a gang and they tell you like the only way that you're you can get out of this gang is if you die pretty much that's how it feels in sex trafficking it's like a life or death thing literally um i wouldn't say that i just felt safe but i felt okay for a while um knowing that i had support from my family members and people in the county um uh, yeah, I'm, I understand the question. I'm just, it's, it's different for everybody. Some, some people feel safe. Some people are like, okay, yeah, I'm free to live my life now. But, you know, you still have the people that's haunted by their memories or with uh, their own, their own self. So you're safe, but technically not really safe. You just learn how to cope through it and get through it as best as you can. Crystal, would you also, I know I had one client that I worked with for a really long time. Um, and also one of the the quotes in the video that we show um, talking about you don't belong in that world anymore. Mm -hmm. Being outside of um, being trafficked and being accepted. And mm -hmm. um, I remember having a conversation with one of my my clients right before she turned 18. And she said she didn't want to be sober and she didn't want to be, she didn't want to be in normal life, right? Uh -huh. Because there she had to be sober. She had to deal with what she had done. Uh -huh. She had to, she had to deal and feel what she had been a part of. Um, uh -huh. And that was for her at that point, that was just, that was, she couldn't imagine so much, 
yeah being in that life and so i think part of it is like um i went to a training once where uh, it was actually rachel lloyd who was speaking in that video who started gems um in new york city and she was talking about leaving the life and talking about it really similar to um recovering from like alcohol right so where like you're on the wagon you're off the wagon right Uh maybe you're you maybe you're being trafficked maybe you're in the life maybe you're stepping away maybe you're just stripping um but that it's not necessarily a in out all Uh of the time um or like maybe kind of piggybacking on that like feeling safe to like feeling safe right Uh it could take years it could take a change of you know living somewhere different to really feel safe um and that's just the reality and that's where i think it's important for us to remember how important those relationships are because we don't get to dictate when someone's going to decide that they feel safe enough or that they're ready to leave or that they want to right so part of it is is putting yourself in a spot where you know you care right you show up I have something to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to hang around this girl that was trafficked. And um, she had thought she was safe. And we kicked it for almost four years. And then one day she came to me. She said that the person that did it to her um, contacted her and told her that if she didn't um, call him or come where he wanted her to meet her, he was going to kill her son. Mm-hmm. And listening to everything that's going on right here brought that back. And I thought about it. I said, am I going to say anything about this? But uh, Crystal, she's right. You have to, they have to trust you. And she trusts me enough to tell me what, she was going through Mm -hmm. and that was was really crazy because um what seven years ago her mom finally got in contact with me and told me that they had found her in a trash can Mm -hmm. Uh. Mm -hmm. and like and i said i I didn't even think i was going to say anything but Crystal hit a nerve and I had to say something. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That is, oh, I'm so sorry. That that, that is part of that, um, that reality, right? Yeah, Um, that hit on. And that's where I think it's so important to, um, to show up right when we can yeah show and then, up and show out yeah yeah because i think that that really matters right and i think when you know we all know you know when you feel cared about right you know when someone's being authentic you know when yeah. you feel you feel that connection and you know part of our job is not trying to force people to change right we can't yeah. we can't do that right Mm-mm. What we can do is we can be a soft place to land, you know, and I hope that I hope that you all um, understand how much we at Ramsey County appreciate you opening your homes and your hearts to the kids that you work with who are so vulnerable and need people to show up and care. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I want to thank you guys all for being here tonight. And um, you can all reach out to your um, your licensing workers. If you ever have any questions or anything like that, um, feel free. You guys can get my, my email address, um, my cell phone number. I'm happy to connect with anybody. If you've got other questions that you weren't really comfortable asking tonight, I'm happy to connect with you. Um, any other time and try to find out ways that we can support you as well. Okay. Yeah. Are there any, 
Okay. I just really want yeah. to thank, thank Crystal too. I mean, we're getting some comments here, Crystal, you know, in the, in the chat here too, just really thanking you because I know that it's not easy to come out and um, talk about your story or, you know, your past. And I really appreciate you being so honest and transparent. Yeah, well, thank you guys all for, yeah. thank you, Crystal, for, for being here too. Thank you, Crystal. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank Crystal. You. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Does anybody thank have you. any other questions or things that you wanted to say before we end? No, not me. Okay, well, well, I'll be here for a bit too, and Crystal can for a bit if anyone has any questions. Okay, thank you guys yeah. so much, though. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Have a good night.